So now that we have some basis on innate immunity, let's talk about adaptive immunity. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through this slide pretty quick, and then we're gonna go into how this whole process works, and then I think it'll make a little bit more sense. So I'm just gonna kinda hit the points really fast on this slide. We'll circle back though, okay? So again, this is gonna be a specific process, okay? So we're targeting a specific antigen, a specific epitope usually, or you know, a specific group of epitopes potentially. The speed in general, when we're talking about adaptive, it's gonna take us time to adapt to that response. However, if we're exposed to that pathogen in the future, we have a heightened response from previous. And that's because we have some memory that's present after the exposure. Again, there's some previous epitope that we were exposed to that we're targeting. That epitope bound to IgM initially, and eventually we'll have class switching, which we'll go through here. And the key points here to remember, um, some of the key players, at least T cells, CD8 and CD4, we'll talk about that in a minute. B cells that can turn into these antibody producing factories, plasma cells, um, specific immunoglobulins, after class switching. So these are all part of the adaptive immune response. And again, I'm gonna go through all this in a second. I'm just kind of introducing it here. So the primary function here, again, is gonna be recognition and resolution of a previously encountered infectious agent. For example, people that may have been exposed to COVID-19, right? They may have developed some memory response to future exposures. But then when you introduce new things like a Delta variant, for example, that might change the body's ability to respond to that pathogen because now maybe it has some protection against that epitope that we were using to mount an immune response again. So we'll get into the details on that. It's gonna involve more of VDJ recombination and hypervariation as opposed to having something that's germline encoded. With VDJ recombination, which we'll go through this all in the antibody video, we're generating different receptors that can hopefully target that epitope that we're being exposed to. Okay, so the key here is these are not germline encoded. They don't come from mom and dad, right? It's not like the innate immune uh, system. These are all gonna come from our initial processes of VDJ recombination when we're creating the variation in our receptors to have something that hopefully can bind to some of these epitopes. Let's go through what this process of adaptive immunity looks like. And this is really gonna be the first layer uh, into these immuno videos that kind of put the big picture together on what's happening here because it's really easy to get lost in the weeds and some of this stuff. So the first thing is, like I said, dendritic cells are gonna be our poster child for antigen presentation. All right, so let's see how this process starts off. So we're gonna go back to our example in the last video. We had some bacteria potentially that you know came into the bloodstream and uh, we talked about what the neutrophil can do in the, in the macrophage, we can digest it, we can have it go through phagolysosomes and we can even potentially present that antigen. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here. How do we present that antigen? So again, dendritic cell here is gonna run into this pathogen. Okay, so it's gonna run into this pathogen and the dendritic cell, what it can do is it can try to digest that pathogen. So again, we're just gonna pretend that we're undergoing phagocytosis here, right? We're gonna eat this pathogen, we're gonna digest it. And then what this dendritic cell will do after it digests the pathogen, it can present components of that pathogen on its surface. Okay, so it can present components of this pathogen. Now remember what we just said, neutrophils do not undergo antigen presentation. It's important to know what cells actually do undergo antigen presentation. Again, the classic one is dendritic cells. That's why I'm using it here. But this could be a macrophage in a tissue. It could be a monocyte in the blood. It can even be a B cell, which we'll talk about in just a second. But for the example right now, let's stick with a dendritic cell. So again, it's loading these protein components, right? These are proteins from this pathogen that it digested onto its cell surface. Now we're gonna to start to integrate some of the material from the last video. So let's just say we have a lymph node here. Okay, so we're gonna say this is a lymph node. So this dendritic cell can travel to a lymph node now with these antigens presented. And inside of our lymph node, remember what we talked about, in the paracortex, right? In the paracortex, we're gonna have some T cells here. Okay, so we're gonna have some T cells. And this dendritic cell is gonna come in and it's going to present those antigens to the T cell. And so the T cells in here, there's gonna be a whole bunch of different T cells. A rare number of these T cells might actually have a receptor that is able to bind specifically to this antigen, okay? To the epitope of this antigen. And this is where that hypervariation, that VDJ recombination comes into play because you have to have a whole bunch of different receptors to have one that eventually binds to this very specific antigen. And so let's just say that this is the T cell, you know, in the paracortex that binds specifically to this antigen. So this T cell is gonna wake up, right? It bound to this antigen, and now this T cell goes from being naive, naive meaning it was kind of just sitting there in the lymph node, not really doing much, to all of a sudden, it found its antigen, now we wake it up, right? So I'm highlighting in yellow here, now it's 
activated. That's what we would say, it went from naive to being activated. Now we have an activated T cell. Now remember, this thing here in purple, that's the T cell receptor, okay? So the T cell receptor bound to the antigen, but what exactly is that antigen on, on the dendritic cell? Well, the dendritic cell uses the major histocompatibility complex to present the antigen. So it uses a major histocompatibility complex, an MHC. Okay, now, dendritic cells can use different types of MHCs. Okay, so it can load the protein components onto an MHC receptor one or an MHC receptor two. And there's a consequence to this. Okay? And I'll talk about that in just a second, but just remember, it can load it on MHC one or it can load it on MHC2. And depending on which MHC it's on, it's going to target different T cells. And we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so this is the general process. We digested a pathogen. We took the components of that pathogen. We put it on our major histocompatibility complexes on our dendritic cell, went to a lymph node, presented it to a T cell that has that same type of receptor and activated that T cell. Now, I also told you that Interestingly enough, the B cells can also present antigens. So down here, I have my B cell. So what happens if my B cell runs into this pathogen? Well, the B cell can also phagocytose this antigen. Okay, so B cells are also antigen presenting cells. They can use phagocytosis, break up this pathogen, and then present the pathogen on MHC complexes. Okay, so the B cells will also have these MHC complexes that they can use to present the antigen, kind of like the dendritic cell. The B cell can also go travel to the lymph node, right? It can go travel to the lymph node and it can find a T cell, just like the dendritic cell. And it can also, just like the dendritic cell, present this antigen to the T cell. Okay, so again, when the B cell goes to the lymph node, right, it's presenting the antigen on MHC2 to the T cell receptor on the T cell that matches that antigen, and then our T cell wakes up. T cell is now activated. Now, what's the difference between these two? Okay, so let's talk about that. So when the B cell presents this antigen, remember, this T cell is gonna get activated and there's a specific connection that's gonna happen be between the B and T cell. And I'm gonna talk about this more as we kind of move through the series here. So if you're a little overwhelmed, don't be overwhelmed by this yet, but this is gonna be the CD40, CD40 ligand. Okay, so this is kind of like a co-receptor that's binding as the B cell binds to the T cell. And that CD40, CD40 ligand binding is gonna allow the T cell to send a signal to the B cell and say, hey, I need you to undergo some class switching. So this additional binding is gonna have the T cell telling the B cell to potentially undergo class switching. So what happens is the T cell is gonna send a signal to the B cell, right? And now the B cell, okay, can turn into a plasma cell and then it can just start pumping out antibodies. Okay, and again, and if we undergo class switching, we might start pumping out antibodies like IgG, IgE, IgA. It's all gonna depend on what type of cytokines that T cell releases to tell the B cell, hey, this is the antibody I need you to produce. I need you to class switch the heavy chain on IgM to IgG, IgE, IgA, all from this process where the B cell presented the antigen to the T cell, okay? And like I said, we're gonna go into that in even more detail. I'm just kind of laying the framework because this is kind of a complicated process, okay? But essentially, again, when the B cell binds here to the T cell, and we have CD40, CD40 ligand binding, the T cell will stimulate the B cell to become a plasma cell, which is essentially like an antibody producing factory, right, to produce these antibodies, okay? And we can also have the class switching because of the CD40, CD40 ligand binding. That's the important part to remember. And this whole thing where we have all these antibodies being produced, this is known as humoral immunity. When you actually class switch to IgG or IgA or uh, IgE, that takes a while, that could take a few weeks potentially. And that's why we say it, you know, adaptive immunity in general, adapting these memory immunoglobulins. IgG, you think of more as your memory immunoglobulin. It shows that you were previously exposed to that pathogen. When you're looking at hepatitis, for example, very frequently we're gonna look at the IgG. Again, it's gonna differ depending on the type of hepatitis, but IgG is gonna tell us we were previously exposed or we were vaccinated because we, at some point we had exposure to that specific epitope or antigen, whereas IgM, again, is gonna be kind of more of a first line antibody or immunoglobulin, okay? So IgG is part of the adaptive immune response. It takes class switching to get IgG. You have to have a B cell binding to a T cell, activating that T cell, right? Stimulating cytokines to cause the class switching to IgG. Now, the thing to remember is that we bound to a T cell here to cause this whole process to happen. But remember, this was all on MHC2 in B cells. Okay, so the way to remember this 
is that you always want to get to eight. It's kind of like the rule of eights here. So if we have anything on an MHC2 receptor, if we multiply two by four, we get to eight, which means the reason I'm showing you this is because MHC2 receptors will bind to CD4 positive T cells. Okay, so CD4 positive T cells are kind of like your helper T cells. Okay, so the helper T cell, so this in this case would have been a CD4 positive T cell because the B cell loaded it on MHC2. And we want helper T cells to release cytokines to help stimulate these B cells to turn into plasma factories. Okay, so that's how you remember. If anything is loaded on MHC2, it's gonna to bind to CD4 positive T cells. Those are the helper T cells. Now, conversely with our rule of eights, if we load something on MHC1, right, one times eight equals eight. So this cell up here, let's say that we loaded it on MHC1, on our dendritic cell. If we loaded it on MHC1, then it would have had to bind to a CD8 positive T cell. CD8 positive T cells are gonna be your killer cells, okay, your cytotoxic T cells. And so these cells, what this CD8 positive T cell will do is it will actually release enzymes to destroy that dendritic cell. You might be saying, well, why is it destroying it? Remember, the dendritic cell is infected with something. CD8 positive T cells usually will be very effective when we're talking about viruses. Most of your cells should express MHC1. So if you know a T cell sees that another cell is expressing an antigen on MHC1 that's not supposed to be there, it thinks that that cell is infected. If you have a virus, that's exactly what happens. If a virus infects a cell, the T cell will recognize it on MHC1 and it will kill that infected cell. So the cell in some ways is essentially sacrificing itself knowing that it's infected, right? Because a virus can hijack a cell and then use that cell that cell's machinery to make more viruses. And so the idea here is the CDA positive T cell saying, hey, you're infected, you might be infected with the virus, let me wipe you out so that this virus doesn't reproduce even more. Okay, so that's like a very simple explanation to it, but that's essentially what's happening. And that cell mediated immunity. The T cell is directly targeting the infected cell. So again, CD4 positive T cells are gonna uh, bind to MHC2, which are very classic for the antigen presenting cells. In general, when these dendritic cells are presenting things to the T cells, you know, usually we'll talk about it with MHC2. The tricky thing here that I want you to remember though, and again, we're gonna keep talking about this, is that in general, the cells that are gonna be the antigen presenting cells, they're pretty much gonna express MHC2. So this dendritic cell, it could express this pathogen on MHC1, it could express it on MHC2, for example. If it expresses it on MHC2, it would be binding to CD4 positive cells. So this dendritic cell can bind to CD4 positive cells or CD8 positive cells because it can load its protein components on MHC1 or two. Almost all of your cells are gonna express MHC1. Let's say it's not an antigen presenting cell. It's kind of just like your everyday cell in the body gets infected with a virus. What happens is that T cell, CD8 positive T cell, if it runs into that cell, it's gonna kill it, right? It's gonna destroy it because it doesn't want that virus to reproduce. Okay, so when you think about MHC1 and CD8 positive T cells, think about kind of like your everyday cells expressing MHC1. Of course, dendritic cells also will express MHC1, um, but classically, we think about dendritic cells you know, usually with MHC2. So I don't want this image to confuse you too much. So just to recap this, going back to the innate immunity, this pathogen enters our body. We have a bacteria enters our body, okay? The bacteria can run into a neutrophil, for example. The neutrophil might digest it. And then the neutrophil will, will try to break it down using the phagolysosomes, using respiratory burst pathway. And it's gonna do all of that because it used a pathogen recognition receptor to recognize LPS, for example, on the surface of this pathogen. Okay, it might use toll-like receptors, right? Or it might recognize the bacterial flagellin. It'll recognize some pathogen-associated molecular pattern, right? That's what we talked about before. Using pathogen recognition receptors, very nonspecific, generates an immediate response. We have interleukin-1, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha being released for an acute inflammatory response. That's what happens initially. Now, eventually, we might have some antigen presenting cells that are gonna run into this pathogen, like this dendritic cell, and it'll digest this pathogen. It'll present that pathogen on its MHC2 or MHC1, it could be either one. It'll go to the lymph node, present that to a T cell, activate the T cell that binds specifically to that antigen, right? And then that T cell can either destroy the dendritic cell if it's on MHC1, or the T cell can release cytokines if it's CD4 positive.
okay? B cells can do the same thing. B cells can run into this pathogen. They can present this pathogen to CD4 positive T cells on MHC2, and that can cause class switching. We can turn these B cells essentially into plasma cell factories, releasing some of these very specific markers that we talked about in the adaptive immune response. Okay, IgG being very classic to show that there's been some previous exposure because we had to have class switching prior. And remember, if we go back to the first video, as these B cells are pumping out these IgGs, IgEs, IgAs, remember, they're all gonna happen in the germinal center of the lymph node, right? So you're gonna get that pale staining in this area after these B cells have started to go through class switching and are starting to kind of replicate themselves. You know, just remember, the majority of these B cells might go to be plasma cells, but there'll be a small number that kind of hang around in the lymph node and become memory cells, okay? And that's true for the T cells too. There'll be some memory cells that stick around, okay? And so those memory cells, if the exposure happens again, if we run into this pathogen in the future, right, maybe a two or three years down the road, we get infected with that same pathogen, these cells are gonna get this epitope presented to them and they're gonna generate a very strong response very fast. That's gonna involve antibodies like IgG from the class switching, for example, before, and we'll be able to readily target this pathogen with a much more robust response. In some cases, not even getting to the point where we have a huge acute inflammatory reaction because we're able to respond so quickly. So the patients might not even have symptoms when they're re-exposed because we can target the pathogen much more rapidly and effectively. And like I said, if you're a little overwhelmed by this, we're going to go through this piece by piece through this video series. So don't worry too much about this, but I at least like to introduce it all here and then we'll kind of build on it as we go.